What is up YouTubes, let's get into this intro video for Magic's latest set, Call Time. Call Time is a top-down design set, meaning flavor is king, and on the plane of Call Time, the focus is Norse mythology. And when it comes to Norse mythology, well, there's a lot of it. Like, a lot, a lot. There's a ton of gods and humans striving to become heroes and defeat various deities and gods. There's also other races like giants and dwarves and elves and dragons breathing fire and guarding treasure. Some highlights you may be familiar with is Odin, a one-eyed raven flanked god who bestowed upon us the runic alphabet. And thanks to the Marvel movies, you may also know that he is the father of Thor, who protects humanity using his mighty hammer, and some not so altruistic folks like shape-shifting, shifty gods like Loki, who live in the heavenly realm of Asgard. Then there's Valhalla, which is a sub-realm of Asgard, and this is where warriors may end up after an epic death then there's also dragons, and some like to guard their mountains full of treasure and protect it from sneaky hobbit seas and dwarves hanging out in the mountains. Yeah, I think it's fair to say Norse mythology has been quite present throughout mainstream entertainment in movies, video games, and TV shows. The view of the world or universe through the lens of Norse mythology is that there are nine realms that grew from and flank a massive universe-sized tree known as Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil, this tree, is what spawned and connects everything. Inhabitants like us humans, or elves, or dwarves, may move between a realm or two in life and death, but generally speaking, we have our space. The gods, however, may move between them, because if a god wants to do something, well, they just can. But with it being a Norse mythology-focused set, of course we also have Vikings, relics of incredible power, runes, and stories to be told and retold throughout the ages. So let's dive into how all this and more translates into Magic the Gathering's latest set call time, starting with Yggdrasil, which is simply called the World Tree. And it is so massive its branches can be seen in the sky of each realm. Now, we do have nine realms in Norse mythology, however, in Kaldheim, we have ten. And with there being ten, conveniently enough, these would be the ten dual-color pairings focused on in this set. The inhabitants of each would make up our two-color archetype, which if you're curious about these and what cards to build around or be ready for in a draft or pre-release, well then you should subscribe and watch my draft guide once the set is fully revealed, but here's the general theme for each color pair. Blue-white is the spirits found in Istfel, blue-black is zombies in the realm of Karfel, black-red is berserkers, which is essentially the viking tribe, you can find them on Immersturm, green-red is trolls and they're on Notvold, white-green is humans on Bredegard, White Black is the Angels of Starnheim, which is also the realm that provides light to the others, in case you were wondering how that all works. Blue Red is Surtland and Home to the Giants, which is an archetype I am probably the most excited about. Green Black is Elves, and they are on Skemfar, and Red White is Dwarves, and their equipment on Axgard. Oh, and last but not least is Green Blue, and they are the Shapeshifters, or Changelings, found throughout Litjara. We also have some new mechanics and returning ones as well, with new card types in this set too. First, with some of the returning stuff, we have Snowlands, and these are beautiful basics, as well as some new fetchable dual lands that ETB tapped. These all look amazing, as does just about all the art in the set. We also have Sagas returning, which the word saga is a Norse word, meaning a long story of heroic achievement, especially a medieval prose narrative in Old Norse or Icelandic, i.e. a figure straight out of a Viking saga. So. This is probably the biggest flavor win achieved here in the set. And keep in mind, each archetype will have its own sagas, legendary creatures that may possibly be inspired by those sagas, or at least gods from Norse mythology, a snow dual land, and an uncommon land that requires both colors for a nice archetype-focused ability. And as mentioned, we do have changeling returning, which makes sense, again, with shapeshifting being a prominent, let's say, skill set in Norse mythology. And then we have two new mechanics in the set, the first being Foretell, which is like Suspend, but allows the person doing the foretelling to finish the story when they so choose. But keep in mind the card is exiled face down, meaning the joy of what is to come is only known by the caster until it is of the utmost inconvenience to their opponent. The other new mechanic is Boast, which can only be used if that creature attacked this turn, and only once each turn. It can be activated at instant speed too, meaning the creature could attack, use the boast ability, and then be smashed to bits, which is not a flavor win, but if they can attack safely, well then that seems rather viking-like and a solid flavor move as well. We also have vehicles back, because if there's one thing vikings are known for, it's their longboats and runes, which, hey, what up, Bluetooth? Runes are a new kind of enchantment that go on permanence, which will usually mean creatures, vehicles, and equipment for now. They provide some bonus ability, like flying, to whatever they enchant. I think it's pretty cool, even if it is a cat-drawn carriage. I mean, 
Yep, this card is based on a Norse god, Freya, who traveled by a cat-drawn chariot. Now, whether or not they were lions or super-powered house cats is up for debate, but the point is, with a flavor-forward set like this, Assume Wizards has put this card in the set for a reason. I'd also say if you're curious about a card, and maybe its story or background, you should Google it, because if there's one thing I think goes woefully underappreciated about sets like this in Magic, where they are flavor-forward, is that they give us an opportunity, however obscure it may be, to just learn something else about somewhere else. Now some other facts and vocabulary to be aware of with Kaldheim, we'll start with the Cosmos or Space, and it's still called the Cosmos, and is inhabited by powerful Cosmos monsters, who are believed to hold all the secrets of the plane, including events of the future, locked inside their minds. Some are small and mischievous, like Toski, our new squirrel legend. Some are strong and powerful beasts, like the wolf Saruf, who appears in many cards throughout Kaldheim. Then there's some that are inconceivably massive, like the serpent Coma, who is the original Cosmos monster, and Coma can also break off into smaller pieces that move and act independently, which only adds to how terrifying this serpent and the Cosmos can be. But if you're brave enough, traveling through the Cosmos is possible, albeit dangerous. The easiest way is through an omen path, which can appear in various forms when two realms get near each other, in the cosmos during their random swaying and movement around the world tree. Sometimes an omen path appears as a shimmer of light that you can simply walk through. Sometimes it's far more treacherous to get to and get through, but these omen paths may be opened and closed by gods and powerful mages too. An omen path can be shocking because it can land you anywhere on that other realm that you may not be expecting, but also because they can appear as a precursor to a doom scar. A doom scar is when two realms collide into each other, causing earthquakes, destabilization of the plane, and total chaos as the inhabitants of each are thrust into conflict with each other. I'm kind of envisioning this as when you sit down to play a draft or a pre-release and the deck you've built is probably a different archetype than the deck your opponent has built, and as you two fight, well, you're creating a doom scar on the battlefield. I'm not sure if that was exactly planned, but I think that's a pretty cool flavor win when looking at the set and hopefully us getting to play with some of the cards at a pre-release or in a draft. Now right here I think it's important to dive a bit into the storyline of the set. Tyrite is the sap of the world tree, and it's quite the magical and powerful substance. It's also dangerous for us mere mortals to touch, so only gods can really use it. Halvar used Tyrite to create a sword capable of opening omen paths and cutting through the cosmos. The Sword of the Realms, in the right hands can be a weapon of good, but in the wrong or more creative hands can be a weapon of unbound chaos. Kaya is here as a hired mercenary to hunt the Phyrexian praetor Vorenklex, who seems to be hiding out on Kaldheim rather randomly. While searching for Vorenklex, she finds Tybalt riling up some trolls and getting them ready for war, which he will start using the Sword of the Realms. He stole it from the gods, impersonating Valky, which explains his flip planeswalker card in the set. Tybalt sends the trolls after Kaya instead, who escapes with the help of a new planeswalker and part-time male model, Tyvar Kell. And Tybalt escapes by opening an omen path using the Sword of the Realms to continue his chaos spreading. We have another new planeswalker as well, Nico Eris, who actually originates from Miletus on Theros. And they are a white-blue planeswalker with the ability to create these shards that can pierce enemies or temporarily hold them in place. So we've got omen paths letting people travel around, doom scars thrusting them into battle with each other, and then planeswalkers either trying to get a big bounty or cause chaos galore going out on the set. But what's it all mean? What's the end game here? Well, clearly there's more to this story than we're going to find out in just this set. But let's finish off what's going on in this set magic card wise. In the set, there's also some landfall effects, even though they don't say the mechanic landfall explicitly on them. And last but not least, we also have modal cards returning, which also appeared in Zendikar Rising. Namely, we finish off the rare land cycle, which was started in that set, but we also get to see a lot of sweet legendary Vikings in these amazing showcase cards. The showcase versions of these cards all depict legendary Viking creatures or gods from Norse mythology and their associated relic. They look amazing, and I certainly have my eye on a few to pick up already, especially in foil. Of course, if your collection building senses are tingling or your brewing mind is bubbling, check out Card Kingdom. They sponsor the channel and there's an affiliate link in the description of the video if you wanna let them know I sent you. That'd be great, thank you. Now to wrap up the video, whether you're a fan of Norse mythology or looking for a new commander option or trying to brew up a spicy new deck, this set has clearly had some passion put into it and there's plenty here for anyone new or old 
to the game of Magic. I hope this video has helped you better understand what is happening in the set, and all in all it helps you enjoy the set more. And you can help me by subscribing, hitting that like button, or if you really want to go above and beyond, become a patron of the channel. Thank you to those who already are and for your support of the channel because y'all make this kind of content possible. Stay tuned for my pre-release and draft guide videos where we really dive into the cards and the archetypes in the set. I'll also be posting the ever enjoyable draft gameplay videos and of course all other kinds of MTG content. I want to say I really appreciate you watching. Thank you for being here and we'll see you in the next video. Peace.